Hello again and welcome to In Taiwan We Speak, your audio guide to Taiwan's mind-blowing linguistic diversity. I am Alexander Shin and today we continue our conversation with Tuhi Martukao or Jocelyn Hongjian Tinghui, a Pinu Yumayan activist, advocate for indigenous people's rights, as well as journalist and TV presenter. Now, Tuhi, some might call Taiwan's legislation on indigenous rights in recent years progressive, while some claim that it is still not sufficient for the actual protection of people's rights. As a member of the Association for Taiwan Indigenous People's Policy, in your opinion, what are some of the policy gaps that Taiwan is yet to fill? Well, I will have to say that if we look at the legal framework, actually, indeed, we have quite comprehensive legal framework regarding the rights of indigenous peoples. But in reality, it's all on paper. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's not really transformed into actions. And for me, the problem is that first, we do have a lot of these legislations that is um, our legislators or people working on it, they learn it from the international arena, especially from the United Nations. But, you know, the discussion on rights, not only about indigenous rights, but also, for example, human rights, is evolving. Mm. You know, with the time, with the society, with all the different kinds of development, the discussion on rights will be different. It's not that we, it will be extremely like opposite from each other, but still it will go along the time. But then I would say that our government or our lawmakers, they don't really follow up with different development that closely. So sometimes when the law or when the legislation is finally adopted, it's already outdated. Hmm. the concept or the idea. And also the other problem I see is that you now with the United Nations, it's very important. There are very some very important concepts regarding indigenous people's rights. First is participation. So everything about us with us, every decision that will affect indigenous peoples, we should be in the discussion. And the other concept is the free prior informed consent. So hmm before anything that is going to happen that again regarding indigenous peoples the people we need to be free of threat free of any kind of unwillingness and before all the things happened we should obtain accurate and also sufficient information regarding the outcomes regarding the process regarding good or bad effects everything and then we should have sufficient time to make decision ourselves mm. in our own ways to say yes or no or to give a condition so this is main principles that the united nation is talking about but back in taiwan a lot of times we cannot really do that so we are not fully um Actually, I don't really like the term consulted because if we say consultation, it's like, okay, I will ask for your opinion. But if I'm going to adopt it, I don't know. I, I will might see. or may not follow. Yeah, mm. we will see which is more suitable or which is more convenient for us to do. So this is a way about consultation. But in United Nations, they are talking about obtain the consensus from indigenous peoples. It's very different. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the process of lawmaking in Taiwan, this is something we are lacking. And also when we are implementing all this legal framework, again, that's the same problem. And I will say that this is not only about indigenous peoples because we always we, we will say that you know we are the experts of our own daily lives. Not only not only for indigenous peoples, but for for example, children, children's rights. When we are talking about children's rights, talking about education, do we have students from elementary school to, for example, PhD, to participate in the discussion about education? Mm. A lot of times, no. We do have experts, but experts are different from people who are in that position who are facing all kinds of different challenges or opportunities the first thing when they open eyes every morning. So it's very different. Mm. So I think that's the thing. And for me, it's also quite sarcastic because, you know, when we are talking about participation, participation is different from 
press it. Mm. A lot of time when I go to different, when I was invited to different meetings, they will say, okay, now we have a representative from indigenous. She is also a young woman. So indigenous youth woman. <laughs> check, check, check. Yeah, check, check, check. So they know they have me as one person, but qualify for three requirements. It's so convenient, but it's not meaningful. Mm. You know, so I will say that's the problem. Why we have all these gaps between implementation and also between um, the reality we have, our expectation, but also what we get from mm. the government. So the processes are clearly flawed. But as you mentioned, while we do have some laws that are actually good, speaking about implementation, which areas do you think specifically are lacking in the way they're implemented? The first thing came out to me is about how we can obtain a consensus. Mm. Because with Indigenous Basic Law, in the Article 21, it said that if there's anything, any projects, doesn't matter if it's about development or it's a research project, anything that would affect Indigenous peoples, they should get the, the consensus mm. or they should consult the Indigenous peoples before that. But then in reality, there are a lot of projects, of course, they sort of go through this process. But when we were asking the Council of Indigenous Peoples, you say before what is going to happen, you have to obtain the consensus. And what is the time? What do you mean by before? Then they say, oh, if it's a project, development project, then that will be before the construction started. It's too late because if you already plan everything, you are already going to have all these machines, all these things mm. to go to the, the spot to start the construction. It's already too late. And then the way how they obtain our consensus is by voting. They mm. say it's democracy. But for us, voting is quite valid. It's a violation against our will because, you know, in different indigenous cultures, we have different kinds of way to make decisions. Well, maybe they're sort of like voting. Also, there are ways to reach consensus. Like, for example, for us, um, we will be having like the consensus within every household and then every household will have their youth, their young men to go to the Balakwan, the men's gathering house to make a communal decision with within the men. And then that decision will again to bring to uh, the traditional chief and also the elders. They will again go through like this uh, decision to see if uh, something really suitable for us. Mm. So it looks like that women are excluded from the process. But actually, within the household, women are in charge. Mm -hmm. So the men who are sent to Balaguan will be bringing the consensus made by the household that is chaired <laughs> by, by women. women. So it's just, you know, our way of defining what is consensus and also what is democracy and mm. also how we make decisions is different from what we have been learning since we were little, like voting is democracy or, you know, election is democracy, but it's not necessarily mm. our way. But within our legal framework, they told us that we have to go through this um, community meeting, community assembly. But with the community assembly, they have a lot of requirement. For example, only people who have their household registration within the administrative district of the community. And also they have to be above 18, then they can go to the community assembly. That's by law, but it doesn't make sense. Hmm. This from the start is already depriving our right to self-determination because we have the right to decide who can represent us to go to the meeting, how we are going to define the members of the community, not necessarily by household registration. For me, I my household registration is in Taipei, but that doesn't mean that I'm not part of the community. So you know, there's a lot of these very small details, mm. but from all these small details, it's not respecting our right to self-determination. And with that, we cannot really make our own decision. And that applies to everything, because if there is something about land, about education, about health uh, policy, all these things, with 
without this concept of having us in the discussion, then nothing is really mm -hmm. no about us, but always without us. Mm -hmm. Is my understanding correct? Because you live in Taipei, right? Yeah. And many people, I assume, moved out of Taidong and live in bigger cities, right? Especially youth. Yeah. But once the culture started being revitalized and preserved, like, for example, the Millet Festival mm -hmm. coming back to become a major celebration, did you see more people coming back for this community kind of time mm -hmm. from cities back into the community? I do think so, and that's why we started to work on different programs because our aim is that if because you know why people are moving out of Taidong or moving out of community because of job job right. opportunity, and if we can have job opportunity right in the community, then we have the incentive mm. for people to move back or to stay in the community, and that's a, that's why we started all this work around ten years ago, and. Um, it's small, very small. It's a bit by a bit, but still, like we can now have more than ten people, mm. so that's an important incentive. But we also want to emphasize that if we want to do things for the community or you know, about the community, of course we need people to really be in the community. Mm. But we also need people, you know, outside the community, but they can still bring different knowledge bring different resources mm -hmm. as well. And also I do think with um, the social media, it helped a lot right. because it's easier for us to allow people to know what is going on in the community, even though we cannot be back all the time because you know, with traffic, with all these things, it's quite expensive mm. <laughs> to go back. But then now, for example, recently, last week, we there's a conference about a development project that is right in the backyard of our community. And uh, it's very um, controversial, I would say, because it will really destroy the, the mountain in our backyard. What is it about? It's they want to build, a, I think it's a, like a villa or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And are they people from the outside of the community? Uh, yeah, of course. Mm. And they want to promote tourism. Yes. Typical. Yeah, typical. <laughs> and they say they will bring like, they will create a lot of job opportunities. They will bring you no know, people. They will bring money to the community. But the thing is, it's not necessary that we are all against all, all this kind of project. It's the thing you have to communicate with us first mm. before you started all these things that's enshrined in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from the United Nations. That's mm. also provided in the Indigenous Peoples Basic Law in Taiwan. Mm. But the thing is, of course, we didn't get really enough and adequate information before that. So last week, when this conference happened, so they are trying to really promote this project and also uh, in a way, they say they are going to, you know, uh, clarify all the mis misunderstanding from the people. But they only have this meeting within a very short notice. So mm. a lot of people, we cannot make the time to go back. But then with um, live streaming, with this online tools that we can have this conference call, we can be part of that meeting. We can also you know, get to know about it and also have the opportunity to, well, not really talk to the developers, but at least within our own people. It's a very important thing for mm. us to be able to know, get to know about what is going mm. on. So the conversation is still ongoing and the it community is, is fighting back. Yeah, we are, we are still trying to see, uh, first of course, we have to, make sure that people really understand what is going on. And then we want to go through a process of reaching consensus within the community. And also, yeah, to come up with a strategy, mm -hmm. how to negotiate or how to reject this project. The development projects that are designed and implemented against the consensus or without the consensus of the local community, how often do these projects happen? Like, how often do you have to actually fight back against these kind of projects? Well, if you talk about, like, overall in Taiwan, I cannot really tell because, you know, it. 
sometimes it's only like when this project is in a big scale, then people will notice. But sometimes it can be as small as, for example, a couple of years ago, that um, there is someone who rent a public land in the back of our mountain, and they cut off all the native trees. They grow the other kind of trees, and then because the other kind of trees, they are more valuable. They can you know just it can grow for like ten years or fifteen years. It's already big enough to be cutting off, and then they can sell it. So they cut off all the indigenous or native trees to do that, and it's not really like in a big scale. Of course, it's already quite big scale for us, and. Nobody noticed.、Mm. That was only because our hunters that went into the mountain to hunt and also to patrol around our traditional territory. Then they noticed it. And at first, when we made petition to the city gov,、uh, the county government, and also like the local、um, district government, they didn't really want to, you know,、mm. respond to us because they say, "Oh, it's rented rented out already, so they have no." Authority to ask the people who rent the the land. They 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 have they didn't really have the authority to ask what they are going to do with that piece of land. So you know, I would say that this kind of small scale destruction is happening. Like maybe every day is a bit too much, but at least every month that will be something happen、mm. around Taiwan. And for my own community, it's not that often. I would say because for, well, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I would say that my the location of my community now because we were relocated by the Japanese, what we have now is not really a tourist attraction spot.、Mm. So we were quite、um, surprised that this development project with the villa or something. They choose this spot to open up a villa in this area. That's a very interesting development. There, the date of recording today is May twenty ninth. I don't know when, dear listeners, you'll hear this episode. But if you do, when you do, please do follow the development about what's happening in the Pinu Yumayan community, and what the community is advocating for. And on that note, that's all our time for today. Once again, dear listeners, we will be waiting for you next week with the last part of our conversation with Tuhi Martukau. Thank you so much, Tuhi, for your sharing, and everyone else, thank you for tuning in. My name is Oleg, and this was in Taiwan we speak. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>